thought we shouldn't have been fighting in the first place. And it was the end of the Pax Americana, or the Golden Age, whatever you want to call it. Most historians speak of the years between the Second World War and Vietnam as the Pax Americana, uh, which is a direct reference, of course, to the Pax Roma uh, of, of ancient Rome, that period, that Golden Age of, of Rome, when it was at the peak of its own strength and of uh, its presence in the world, and things went downhill from then. Uh, on. We had a, beep, a, a brief beep, uh, if you will, when we got Mr. Kennedy and, and we once more felt proud. But there was a, there was a time uh, uh, in there when the, the Pax Americana was great and then we hit Vietnam. Uh, but it is also, um, unfortunately, another blow to clericism. That is to say, a number of our pastors uh, across the nation also supported the Vietnamese War. Uh, and were a, a bit of warmongers. And it, it came to be a matter of great concern uh, and, and, and has affected religion ever since. That having been said, the thing that probably happened next that was most dramatic is twofold. The civil rights movement. The civil rights movement, uh, not because of the reasons you think, uh, not because of the integration of the races, but because in that course of that integration, we got our first real whiff in the dominant white Caucasian culture of what it meant to worship God, to have a religious life that didn't have preachers and churches that were our kind of preachers and churches, and that did allow the congregation to jazz a little bit. And Micah, Row Your Boat became the theme song uh, for a while of the last part of the century because you could do it this way. And so we got a first inter introduction, if you will, to American Christians um, uh, who had a spirituality that was in a spirituality that was indigenous to them, this is going to be really hard, that, were in, that was indigenous, that, that they could feel, that was in their bodies. And it's aggravated by that thing called the Sony Walkman. Now, the Sony Walkman comes just shortly after the, uh, the civil rights movement really gets started. And all of a sudden, we see these kids going down the street like this, you know, with things in their ears, and they are purely in their own world, and if you don't watch out, they'll walk into you because they're not looking at you. They're inside their skulls, but they're jazzing it up. It's aggravated, of course, by the iPod, uh, to say the least, because if you sit on a plane now, you know that the whole thing could probably fall in the ocean, and half of the people in the fuselage wouldn't even know it because they're so plugged in, you know. Until they hit the water, it would be their first. Why does that matter? Why does it matter to religion? It matters simply because of this one thing. It is music that is participatory instead of performance. Reformation, the Reformation was hierarchical, it was intellectual, and it was highly individual. The Protestantism that comes out of it, and even the Anglicanism that is informed and shaped to some extent by it, are all of those things, hierarchical, intellectual, very individual. And part of that means that we, one of the things the Reformation gave us is pews, screwed down and in a row. They're screwed down and in a row so you can look up at the preacher because we all know that 500 years ago you probably was, were illiterate or you came from illiterate parents. And if you were going to have sola scriptura as your base of authority, and if you were going to have the priesthood of all believers, you had to come every Sunday morning not so much to worship as to be instructed by the one guy who could read. And therefore, lest you doze off or lest you go out and chase a dog or, or do something like that or have a little conversation over in the corner, which was what the medieval cathedral was, we got the screwed down pews and we got the elevated pulpit and we got the fact that anywhere you looked, ultimately you had to look up at that man as he droned on and told you what you needed to know. That's hierarchy. We got concomitant with it the music that is played by the organ, which is up there beside the man who's droning on, you know? And, and up, until, up until the Walkman comes along, even with all due respect to the old Victrola and, and, and Caruso singing on those old 78s, those of you who can remember that, the truth of the thing was the only place you could really hear music up until the last century, music of any real sort, was in church. Now, if you were in a, in a little village church or something, then Miss Susie was playing the piano, 
And she wasn't all that good, but at least she had a piano, you know? Uh, and, and you could go hear her. If you were in a big city or if you were near a cathedral, you had that organ and you had that accomplished organist and you could go hear good music and it was performed. The sermon was performed. Everything was performed. Once you get the combination of the civil rights movement and the introduction to a form of indigenous American spirituality and religion that is not necessarily performed, that is participatory, and once you get the beginning of the Sony Walkman you get a shift in what people want. What they actually begin to want is the ability to feel it, you know? The ability to shake with it a little bit. And a big part of what's going on right now in emergence Christianity is, and never underestimate it, is a strong desire to feel in the body what the faith is. Whatever other characteristic you may lay at the door of emergence Christianity, it is deeply incarnational, and it does not mean that word in the same way theologians usually mean it. It's not talking about God in human form in terms of Jesus Christ. It's talking God in my human form. I want to feel it. And you cannot, with all due respect to Bach, he is still Bach. And I will go to a concert one night a year and hear the old boy just for old time's sake, you know? but don't do it to me on Sunday morning. You know, on, or, or please, it would be much better if we didn't even do Sunday morning, but we have to do Sunday morning. Then don't do that. Now, this is heresy. You try saying to your vestry, uh, we are going to unscrew the pews. Uh, we'll just stop there. I mean, you know, that, that's the showstopper. <laughs> We're going to unscrew the pews. We're going to take that, that thing, that pulpit down. We're going to sit in loose chairs or in sofas or, or, or easy chairs or whatever, and we're going to face each other. And whoever is doing the talking is going to be sitting right down here in the chair with us. Uh, and after about 10 minutes of listening to X drone on, whoever X is, we're going to then open up a conversation, whether we're twittering or not uh, in terms of electronics. We're going to twitter with each other. And we're going to decide whether we think what got said really plays in Poughkeepsie. Uh, you know, was that good exegesis? Was that honest? Because the other thing about emergence Christianity is it's deeply relational. And when you sit like that, you're not having any relationship much with the folks next to you because you're all looking at me. And it doesn't much matter where I go in this room to stand, you're going to end up still having to look at me in some way that doesn't allow you any kind of horizontal intimacy. Uh, you know? and, and so emergence Christianity is deeply relational. It, 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 it wants that. The other thing it says is, so um, you've got this fella uh, or gal coming down in all those... Um, fancy dresses and robes, and every once in a while, one of them has a really big gold ring, or every once in a while, they wear purple, or they have these funny hats. Is that authentic? What does that mean? Is that, does that do anything for God other than give him a giant belly laugh? It's a good question. It's a good question. Is it authentic? Is it real? And so what we get out of, out of the last part of the last century is those three questions. Is it authentic? Is it relational? Is it incarnational? And they hit immediately our space. They hit everything we do physically about the space in which we worship. Now, one of the things I'm going to say to you, and will say several times as a matter of fact, if you're interested in, in a, helping an emergence uh, congregation, to come up out of your situation. If you're interested in having what the Bishop, uh, what Archbishop Rowan Williams calls a mixed economy church or congregation in which there is an alternative worship or an emergence uh, component as well as the traditional one, you're never going to put them in the same physical space. An emergence congregation cannot meet in this space. It won't happen. Now, you can come close to doing something alternatively, but you'd have to jazz it up, and you'd really have to have some dancing in the aisles. It's because there's not that thing. It's not authentic. It doesn't belong to our time. It's hierarchical, and we aren't. 
It's because it's very intellectual. You are here frantically taking notes, every one of you. I am really glad. I thank you. I hope Gary Hall sees you doing it because it sort of justifies his bringing me here. But you're doing it. You see? You're doing it. You're not holding hands with each other. You're not chattering with each other. You're not nudging each other. You're not getting up and going back and getting a cup of coffee and coming back. You're being intellectual. Be, be very careful about that. Be very careful about that. And you're deeply individual. One of the things that Elizabeth told me this morning when I came in that was sort of sad was, we're doing prayers, right? We're doing worship services uh, each time as we began an end session together. And we're doing them out of what you and I would recognize as a missalette. It's, it's lifted out of a, of a breviary, right? And we're doing it like this because that's the way you do it if you come up out of 500 years of Reformation study. Our intention was for the closing prayers at 3.30 this afternoon to put the drop-down screen, don't die, those of you who are traditional, to put the drop-down screen here and put the words of the 3.30 service up on the screen. Why? So we could offend half of you? No. So we could make, so we could make the point. And the point for the emergence, the reason for the drop-down screen is not to be cool. The reason is that if you're honest, when you're looking at a breviary or a missalette like this, you are deeply into yourself. You, include, you, you enclose yourself even more. When all of us turn and look at the screen and get the prayer off of that, we become far less individual. We are far more centralized. It lifts us up out of the private experience into a shared experience. That's what the screen is about. I used to say if I had one more priest come up to me after a meeting and say, can you show me how to do one of those emergence uh, congregations? We've already got the drop-down screen. I was going to die, you know, because they clearly don't understand the reason for the screen. It's not to save money on hymnals. Um, it's, a psycho it's a psychological shift uh, in, in where you're focused. So the, the Sony Walkman, in dead seriousness, the Sony Walkman, uh, in conjunction with the civil rights movement and the beginning of the integration of worship experiences uh, amongst the races is of huge importance, the, the combination of those, uh, in terms of what your internet uh, is the basis of the great emergence in, in every way. It's the basis of emergence Christianity in the same way that one can say that the printing press uh, was the, the fundamental basis for Protestantism or the thing that was the great enabler, maybe that's what I mean. Um, the net has enabled it. The net has also enabled great emergence as a social construct. It is our connectedness that makes the great emergence possible. It is certainly our connectedness that makes possible uh, emergence Christianity. Now, having said uh, all of that, I want to, if you will permit me, to just skip the rest. That There are about 44, I think I counted it one time, 44 different things that happened in the peri-emergence that got us where we are. And obviously, if we spend 44, or do 44 of them, uh, we're not going to get where we have to get. And so, uh, with your permission, is it all right to close? Have you got this, those of you who want it? Okay. I want to uh, not do any more with the peri-emergence uh, and get to uh, how, who we are and, and, to some extent, what we look like and why. Uh, the uh, Pinenberg, uh, uh, Walter Pinenberg is a theologian known to many of you. Um, German, obviously. Uh, he is uh, credited with being the original source for what I am about to do. Uh, in this country, Wade Clark Roof, uh, who is also, I hope, known to many of you, invented the, the generation of seekers term, uh, University of California, now emeritus, is the one who began to deal with this scholarship and to put it out uh, for general uh, consumption. So whether you, whether you um, attribute it to Dr. Roof or whether you give it to pa Walter Ponenberg, doesn't matter. But certainly what I'm about to do is not of my own invention. Uh, all of us who do this have played with it a little bit, so I think it picks up some idiosyncratic uh, uh, parts to it. But basically, it is, it is common scholarship. What Ponenberg said, and again, I remind you and say for the sake of those who, who were not there yesterday, we are now limiting our remarks to North, largely, pretty largely, to North American uh, Christianity. This same thing could be said of other areas uh, and also of Judaism. But please hear what I'm saying in terms of, of Christianity in this country right now. What Punnenberg said, and he said it sometime in the 60s originally, probably about 62 or 3 was when he first said it, was that by 2000, 
uh, Christianity in North America, and he was saying, of course, in Europe also, but in Latin Christianity was what he was saying. Christianity in Latin, in, in Latin Christianity, North American Christianity, would be uh, fairly equally divided into four distinct groups. Um, uh, the first of which, he said, was liturgical Christians, by which at that time he meant uh, us and Roman Catholics and some confused Lutherans probably, but no Orthodox. We weren't, there weren't enough Orthodox for him in this country to see them. Uh, the uh, next half a third quarter, quarter of was social justice Christians. Now, he called the main line. Uh, I, I don't use that term, and it, it's not used by many uh, people who are doing this anyway anymore, because it's a, a bit of a confusion. The biggest part of the confusion is that Anglicanism belongs over here, and sometimes when you say mainline, Episcopal Church shows up over here, and that's a major confusion that most of us in this room cannot afford. I have to say again, Anglicanism is not a denomination. It is a division of Christian church, looks like a denomination, walks like one, talks like one, quacks like one, but it is not a duck. It really is part of the Anglican tradition, and that's a distinct form of Christianity. Um, so social justice means primarily, if you want to give it denominational names, Methodist, uh, Presbyterians. Uh, uh, those. The difference here, if it helps any, the difference here is at, at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, build a Habitat for Humanities, or you can take the Mass. The liturgicals are going to go take the Mass. The, Baptist, uh, uh, the Methodists and Presbyterians are going to go build the Habitat for Humanity. Uh, and, and it's the old faith and works dichotomy. You know, it's nothing new here in any way. Down here, uh, conservatives, this, this quadrant has had every kind of name thrown at it. If it helps denominationally, and it's such a simplistic reduction, but even at one point, Southern Baptists were put down here as if they occupied the whole thing. Uh, this is evangelicals. Um, this has also been called things ugly like theocrats. Every one of those terms bears some freight that I find unfortunate, and so I find myself coming back to the conservative thing. That too is a bit of a confusion, but if you can, if you can think of it as those who are most um, most, it were most intimately involved with Jesus as opposed to the Christ, if that helps, it, it rhetorically, it's a rhetorical distinction. These people would probably have said Jesus a hundred years ago. We would have said the Christ or Christ up here in this corner. And that too is a, is a ridiculous kind of simplicity. Over here, what's now called the renewalist, which is a fancy word, thank God, for what we used to call Charismatics and Pentecostals. They've always shared this quadrant. I have never, you can tell me now, and I won't know an hour from now, the difference between a Pentecostal and a Charismatic. But I do know if you want to really anger a Charismatic, you put him or her in the same box on a chart with a Pentecostal. It really ticks them off big time. And in general, the other thing happens too. About, and it was so difficult in the academic world that two years ago, the Pew Foundation went through and did a major study of American religion and invented the word renewalist and said to everybody, we're going to put them together in a common label and get rid of the animus between them. Nobody, I think, can even remember what the study was, but every one of us sighs with relief, we've got a word now so that it's not freighted with anger. The renewalist uh, comes straight up out of the Azusa Street experience uh, and the spread uh, of it. Uh, it. Charismatics may not like that, but it's true. Um, these folk are deeply important. As I said yesterday and will say again, this is in many ways the X factor. This is the new thing in, in Christianity. Emergence Christianity is informed hugely by the presence of this quadrant that wasn't even there when the Reformation came along. This is the new part of the picture. Now, what Ponenberg said was, as we become more and more loosed from our natal traditions, that is to say, as we become more urban, as women become more and more empowered, Susie doesn't have to finish high school and get married and stay home and live next door to grandma and raise three more little Susies. 
That's not true. She now goes to work. She now goes to college. She goes to work somewhere in the city, and she remembers to call Mama on her birthday. Uh, you know, it's a, and a week before her own, just so Mama won't forget that it would be nice to have a check. But, but as we become more and more loosed from those, as the home ceases to be the purveyor of biblical literacy, as we lose biblical literacy, as we become more and more aware of other religions and become more and more unclear of exactly what it is that Christianity is different from and why we should be exclusive about the whole thing. As all of that begins to happen, and as we come to live um, in apartment houses and to work in factories, all of us, and, and live in, and work in cubicles together in office buildings, as we cease to have independent homes and have condos and live in units, as all of that happens, what was going to happen, said Ponenberg, and he was exactly right, what's going to happen is that right here, which is where the energy is, because evangelicalism has been enormously energetic since the Second Great Awakening, right here, the people who are evangelical, who are now cut loose to some extent, let's say Susie, I hate to take Susie, but let's take Susie, I'm going to abuse her, I might as well. Susie's away from home for the first time. She's got herself a brand new college degree. She's living in a cute little condo in the city. She's proud as she can be. She has no furniture, but she's happy. Uh, and she's working in an office and for the first time making friends that aren't from her town. This is 80% of America, by the way, that I'm describing here. A little over 80%. For the first time, she's working and, and she's got her own place and it's just great. And she's beginning to make friends that aren't friends from childhood. And one of those friends happens to be a Pentecostal. Oh my goodness. Well, it's Susie's first opportunity to know a Pentecostal. And they begin to have coffee and they begin to talk to each other. And the first thing you know, they're going to a movie together or they're going to a concert together. And in the course of things, uh, Susie discovers that her Pentecostal friend really thinks she can heal things uh, with prayer. What a concept. Susie is a Baptist, uh, and you do a lot of praying, but you don't really expect anything to happen. Uh, you know. <laughs> Surely you don't connect the two, uh, you know. It's, it's a matter of focusing yourself for whatever God's going to do uh, as opposed to the other way around. Uh, and uh, it gets to be really interesting. It gets to be especially interesting when Susie's Pentecostal friend uh, can cu cure a head cold. Uh, and even more interesting when Susie's computer goes down and her friend comes in and lays hands on it and the thing starts working again. Um, and, and that becomes really confusing, and that's a good Pentecostal story. Uh, you can heal more things than just folks. Um, and, and so they begin to talk, and what they're doing is God talk. Uh, it's not theology, it's God talk. They're just talking about, why does that happen? Do you really pray, do you think God hears you in that way? You know, I'm not sure. And it's right in up there with which wine shall we have for supper tonight? And you want to go to a movie? And do you really think God does that? It's not a set-aside time to do theology. It's just part of the conversation. It's part of how we live. And in the course of that, they meet another little girl. I seem to be on girls. That's all right. They meet a little girl over here who does this neat thing on Christmas Eve. It's the only time she does it. But she, on Christmas Eve, goes down to the nearest Episcopal church and she does this incredible thing. There is this beautiful service. And who knew that was part? We don't do that in the Baptist church. Oh my goodness, no. Uh, had no idea. And the first thing they know, not only is it Christmas Eve, but there's a thing called Evensong every once in a while. And it's maybe at the Roman Catholic church. Or you can go look at all those beautiful things in the, in the Orthodox Church, and there's that icon and the conostasis, and isn't that fascinating? And all of a sudden, there are colors, to, and there's smells, and there's bells, and there's a kind of sex appeal to this part of Christianity. I don't want to be an Episcopalian. Mm -mm, wouldn't do it for anything. I don't want to be a Roman Catholic. Wouldn't do it. Don't want to be Orthodox. But I sure would like to come every once in a while and just look at what you're doing, you know? Uh, and I wouldn't mind borrowing your Book of Common Prayer, if you don't mind, since there's no copyright on it. I'd be pleased to lift part of it uh, and, and maybe even circulate it with some friends, uh, you know? Uh, and that's kind of interesting. And could you tell me about the liturgical year? What does the liturgical year mean? 
I'm going to meet next month with Church Publishing, which is our church-owned publishing house. We can't prove it, but I'm very, very sure that the majority of our literature as Anglicans, as Episcopalians, dealing with the liturgical year and the ancient disciplines of the faith are going to emergent Christians and emergent cohorts. And our Book of Common Prayer is in almost every gathering, or at least pieces and parts of it. That's why one of the reasons it's important for us in the rest of this discussion to remember Anglicanism is a tradition. It is a way of being Christian, and we are its presentation. It is important to remember that Roman Catholicism, still for the emergent Christian, has a certain cachet. They're not quite sure what it is, but it's a little too churchy. Protestantism is not exactly what they're rebelling against. That's too aggressive. But it sure is where they came from and ain't going to go back to. Orthodoxy is not accessible enough. It does have those cool icons, but it's very hard to get beyond that unless you're trained in it. And the last man standing, the last man of the four tributaries is Anglicanism. And the empathy, the sympathy, the resonance between Anglicanism and emergence Christianity is startling. About 22 or 23 months ago when I began to have to admit to myself that as an Anglican I was not looking chauvinistically, that I was looking realistically uh, at what was going on, it was amazing to me. I think I had defended myself from that truth thinking that I was just seeing the world I was used to looking at. That's not true. That is not true. And one of the, don't ever forget, the, Rowan Williams, Archbishop of Canterbury, has been here for, uh, England is ahead of us. Uh, Europe and, and the UK and its provinces or its former colonial uh, secularized or went into the emergence about 25 or 30 years before we did in this country. So as a result, they're much farther along. But be aware that Bishop Catherine is very, very aware of what's happening and of the resonance between Anglicanism and emergence Christianity. Remember, and I think I said it to you yesterday, Brian McLaurin is the leader, he's the guru, he's the Martin Luther of emergence Christianity. And who was it other than, who was the only non-Anglican asked to address Lambeth last, last summer? Brian McLaurin. Brian McLaurin. Um, so that, all of which is to say, I don't want to lay a burden on you greater than that of being a parish vestry in a parish that seems to not have as many people on Sunday morning as you wish, but I'm going to lay it on you anyway. Uh, as Anglicans and as Anglican leaders and as Lang uh, Anglican uh, ordained folk, uh, there is a mission field here that we can't even begin to fathom, can't even begin to fathom uh, because of that resonance. And so, and so it is that Susie and her two friends because they are young and because they are moral, and if the emergence is anything, it is incredibly moral. Uh, it is so sick of Hugh Hefner and his fallout, uh, you know, and, and uh, the excesses of consumerism and patent greed uh, that it almost breaks its back being moral. Because they are moral and because they are concerned, they're going to go build this Habitat for Humanity. And as they build it, they're going to pick up some folk who are of that persuasion. And what's going to happen, and this is simplistic, but what's going to happen is, like this, more and more, we don't belong to any quadrant, though we clearly came out of one. We don't belong to a quadrant. We belong to each other. We belong to the fact that by now we have something that looks a lot like a cell church, or like a house church, or like a beer and Bible at the local pub, or like just, you know, supper on Tuesday evenings to talk. This becomes our church. This becomes the place we inform each other in the faith. And the first thing you know, we discover that there is a cell or a house church or something over across town, or that the beer and Bible session has gotten too big and they've broken into two and gone to two different pubs, and it's possible uh, to go to one of them also as well as to go to your... And then before long, you discover